Jonah chapter number 3 and verse number 5. It says, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. And he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily. Everybody say mightily. And cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. And I love verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. I want to... Uh, look back through these verses. In verse number 5, it says that the people of Nineveh put on sackcloth. Verse number 6 says the king of Nineveh covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Verse number 8 says that there was a decree from the king that every man and every beast would be covered with sackcloth. And I want to preach on that word tonight, sackcloth. Sackcloth. And uh, more specifically, I would like to ask you the question, and you can keep it in the back of your mind tonight. I, I really feel a burden on my heart to, to preach tonight. And uh, I, I hope you help me. I trust that you'll help me preach, but but uh, I, re I really feel a, a burden tonight. I, I want to ask the question, where was Jonah's sackcloth? I want to ask tonight, where was Jonah's sackcloth? Let's ask the Lord to help us in this place. God, we love you. Lord, <coughs> we're so thankful for your presence, for the worship, the praise that has already gone forth in this place. Lord Jesus, every resistance, every opposing spirit that would seek to hinder the will of God and seek to hinder the Word of God going forward, I pray today that you would bind every spirit, every demonic spirit, every satanic attack that would come against this service tonight. Lord, let the Word of God lodge in place. Let it find a lodging place in our hearts. Oh, God, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. We praise you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift our voices one more time. Hallelujah. Can we lift our voices? Can, can we hear some voices tonight? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Touch us tonight, God. Help us tonight, Jesus. Touch our children tonight, Lord. Our young people in this service. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Amen, amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Now, is this mic going to give me trouble? Is it going to go off? If it is, I, I'll just get me uh, one of these with cords on it. If it's, if it, it's a new battery. All right. I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. These are the words of the prophet Jonah to the distressed mariners that day who were desperately wondering 
the cause of this sudden storm was threatening to take their vessel to the depths of the sea. Jonah had disobeyed the call of God and he thought he was going to flee in the opposite direction. I'm going to tell you something, you can't get away from God. I don't care how much you drink, you ain't going to get away from God. I don't care how many voices that you surround yourself with or how many friends that you have, you're not going to get away from God. And you hear me, if you've got a praying father and a praying mother, you're not going to get very far away from those prayers. You might do all the sinning that you think you're big enough to do, but I'm going to tell you, 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 I'm telling you, them prayers are going to follow you right on into that place where you're sinning. They're going to follow you. Amen. Jonah had disobeyed the call of God. And, and instead of being willing to minister to the wicked city of Nineveh, he chose rather to book passage on a ship at Joppa to go with them even unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah, what you don't realize is you're not going to get away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah, God can find you even, even on this far away uh, escape route. God can find you. And I'm telling you, you can go to the ends of the earth tonight, but God can find you where you are. You can escape to the jungle. You can escape to the desert. You can escape to the the high seas of the ocean. But I'm telling you, God can find you wherever you are. And so the sailors began to frantically throw the wares overboard. And I preached one time about throwing the wrong things overboard. A lot of times when when people get in a storm, they start throwing things overboard that that they ought to be they they ought to be keeping. Amen. They throw a lot of times people throw their commitment to church overboard in a storm. Amen. They throw their prayer life overboard in a storm. They throw their worship overboard in a storm. They throw their tithing and their giving overboard in a storm. And it don't cause the storm to cease at all. What you need to do is throw Jonah overboard. You need to throw your disobedience overboard. You need to throw your rebellion overboard. You need to throw your bad attitude overboard. You need to throw your pet sin overboard in the midst of the storm. Hallelujah. And so they began to look around at the human beings and and anyone maybe in their superstitious minds that were bringing the wrath of the gods, so to speak, in their direction. And finally they put their finger on a man by the name of Jonah. And that is when he tells them, look, I'm a Hebrew. I know the one true living God. He's the maker of the sea that's tossing us around. And He's the maker of the dry land. And I am the reason that this storm is going on. I'm the reason. Let me tell you, if you think your actions don't affect anybody else, you just need to read your Bible. Amen. Your actions affect everybody around you. Your sin affects everybody around you. Your resistance to the will of God, it affects everybody around you. And so Jonah even suggests, why don't you throw me overboard? I'm the problem. I'm the one that's brought this storm upon all of us. And yet they were reluctant to get rid of this wayward preacher. And and, and so they tried to manage their way through this tempest just a, a little longer. But it didn't work. It 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 was it was not going to work until uh they got the problem fixed. And I want to tell you today, there's some things that are not going to work out until you get the problem fixed. Hallelujah. It's time to quit blaming this one and quit blaming that one and quit pointing a finger at somebody else and and, and putting the responsibility on the church and finding fault with everybody. And it's time to look down in your own heart. If things are not working, there may be something down in there that needs to be fixed. You need to look at your own attitude. You need to look at your own actions. And if things are not working out, you need to 
But you need to figure out what the problem is. It may not be brother or sister or mother or father or friend or foe. It just may be the answer lies in your own heart. There's a lot of storms. You hear me saint, saint and sinner alike. Hear me tonight. There's a lot of storms that we bring on ourselves. Storms that we could avoid, but because of our own stubbornness, because of our own self-will, because of our own made-up mind, we sail right into the storm. And it'll never get better. You hear me somebody tonight. It'll never get better until you finally submit. Until you finally surrender. Until you finally yield to God and say yes. It will never, it will never get better. Amen. And so they took up Jonah. And they cast him forth into the sea. And the Bible said the sea ceased from her raging. A calm sea when they got rid of the problem. I'm going to tell somebody tonight, your answer is in your repentance. Your answer is in finding an altar somewhere and getting the Jonah out of your heart. Hallelujah. And yet, here is Jonah. The storm is now the least of his problems. God has prepared an even bigger problem. God has prepared a fish, a great fish, to swallow Jonah. And there he stays three days and three nights. I want to come back to this again. You're going to go from one calamity to another calamity until you get some things right on the inside of you. Amen. You're just going to go from one, you're going to go from a storm to being swallowed up by a fish until you get some things right down on the inside. The Bible said he was there for three days and three nights, and then Jonah prayed. I wonder why it takes so long. I wonder why it takes so long for us to submit ourselves on down and say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. To finally humble on down and say, you know, I'm wrong. I was wrong. I I, I need to go back and do what's right. I, 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 I was wrong. I need God to help me to finally say yes to the commands of God. And God keeps tightening down the vice grips. Oh, those those corkscrews just keep getting tighter and tighter. God is cranking up the pressure. Have you ever had God crank up the pressure on your life? God says you're not going to get away. You're not going to do your own thing. You're not going to go your own way and set your own sail. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to keep tightening down on you. I'm going to make you squeal, uncle, until finally Jonah prays. Now, I want to tell you, this, this is the beginning of what we see as a cycle in Jonah's life, as something that God has to continually inflict on him, that God has to make him uncomfortable. God has to turn his world upside down before he finally will submit and yield to the will of God. Hey, Pastor, you're preaching negative tonight. Oh, I'm going to tell you, if you follow this, it'll get real positive in your life. You can walk in victory... You can walk in blessings like you've never known if you can just get this principle down. Amen. Some of this trouble that comes into our lives, and I have felt so impressed to tell this church again and again here lately, some of this trouble that comes into our lives is to get our attention. It's to get us praying. It's because spiritual things are not a priority. Church is just one of the other things that we do in life. God is not first place. God is not Lord above all. And until He is Lord on the throne of your life, you're going to keep running into brick walls. You're going to keep knocking your head up against things, against obstacles. There's going to be trouble turned loose in your life until you bow your knee and say, Yes, God, you're first in my life. My hobbies are not first. 
My family is not first. My money is not first. Other people's opinion is not first. My best friend is not first. My job is not first. My own pleasure is not first. God, you've got to be first in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many times, saints, remember with me, how many times we wouldn't have prayed except some great big old troubles come and knocked us off our feet. Hello, somebody. I mean, just a great bit. Everything's going along. And I'm going to tell you, we get so complacent. We get so lukewarm. We get so indifferent. We get so calloused. And we just kind of glide along and coast along and think that the rest of life's going to be this way. And God just takes the devil off his chain and says, okay, buddy, sick him. And our world turns upside down. And boy, we wake up, we start binding devils and re- re- rebuking Satan and, and, and getting the anointing oil and, and uh, wa- walking around praying. And, and we should have been doing that all along. My Lord, when God blesses us, it ought to make us fall on our face say, Thank you, Jesus. Woo, your children are healthy. You ought to be on your knees every day saying, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You got health in your body. Your bills are being paid. You got a roof over your head. You got food on your table. It ought to make tears come to your eyes. You ought to get emotional when you think about how good God has been to you. It ought not take a big bad devil turn loose in our lives to get us back on our knees crying out for help again. Oh, Lord. And he prays, and he prays, and he prays. And he said, out of the belly of hell, I cried unto the Lord. And he heard me. How many times have I been to the very belly of hell to get me back to, to heading on right back up to my place in prayer. Put my head up under a pew and say, God, if you don't help me, I don't know what's going to happen. God, if you don't come to my rescue, I, I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. How many times has it had to be turned loose in our lives? Amen. For us to, uh, before we're going to develop a consistent and a, 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 a progressive and, and a prevailing walk with God, a prayer life that will not turn loose of the things of God for anything. Oh, and I'm going to tell you, after this three-day prayer meeting, an all-night prayer meeting for three nights, brother, when Jonah got spit up out of that well, he didn't have to have sermon notes. He didn't have to have a soundtrack. He didn't have to have applause. He didn't have to have a great big platform or a PA system or a bunch of saints on a padded pew with an air condition blowing on them. He didn't have to have any of that. Amen. He got out hey boy, when God finally turned him loose. When God finally let trouble spit him up on dry land. How many times have we been vomited up by trouble? And my we come out and say, boy, God, I'm going to be shouting this Sunday night. Man, I'm going to be pray. I'm going to pray. You won't have to beg me to pray with people in the altar. Oh, you won't have to ask me to testify. You won't have to get somebody to cheerlead me to get some worship coming out of my life. And man, we hit the ground running with the desire to do something for God. Woo! Jonah got out there and he started preaching. I'm going to tell you, he didn't have a three-point sermon. He wasn't quoting poetry. He wasn't digging out of old Spurgeon sermon books and G. Campbell Morgan. I'm telling you, he hit the ground running and he got in there and there was something so intense and there was something so passionate and there was something so turned upside down in Jonah. All he preached was, yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. And brother, I'm telling you, it was so powerful. He had such conviction about it. He felt it so deeply. He was so persuasive. He didn't have to give an altar call. People were ready to make things right. There was no disclaimer. Amen. People were ready to, to, to find out what they needed to do to change their lives and get the judgment of God. 
Amen. Off of their lives. This statement over and over and over and over. And it's amazing to me. For it to be such a wicked and godless city. That they responded. To somebody who was on fire for God. I'm going to tell you, you say, well, which Bible study is going to help us reach people? And what's the technique? And what do you tell them? And, and exactly what, what do you say? And, and uh, what's the steps you go through to kind of explain doctrine, ex- explain tongues, and explain the oneness, and explain holiness? So exactly how do you, what angle and what approach and how persuasive should you be? And what kind of sales techniques? I'm going to tell you, you don't have to have any of that if you get on fire for God enough. If you get on fire, people will come to watch you burn. You let a house catch on fire, a building catch on fire. Folks will start coming in because there's something about fire that's attractive. There's something about fire that's contagious. You get one fire hot enough, it'll catch something else on fire. A fire will grow. It's natural. And I'm telling you, if the saints ever get on fire, if the ministry ever gets on fire, if the church ever gets on fire, if the pulpit and the pew ever get on fire, I'm telling you, we don't have to have technique. We don't have to have ability. You don't have to have personality. All we need is to get on fire and it will change the hardest of sinners. Amen. And here is a wicked city far from God. And yet it is surprising that they listened to Jonah. And the Bible said they believed God. And they proclaimed a fast. And they put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them, even to the least of them. Now that doesn't mean a whole lot to us. That doesn't mean a whole lot. But uh, I understand what it means to proclaim a fast. I understand what it means when they believed God. But what exactly were they saying when they put on this sackcloth. You understand sackcloth was a... Y'all still with me? Sackcloth was a coarse and rough material that used in making sacks for grain. Anybody ever seen a burlap sack? Anybody ever worked with a burlap sack? (laughs) Amen. And uh, if you've carried a burlap sack very long, you know it's not made for comfort. And... uh, 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 you know, uh, it was, it was, uh, it's used as a mesh to allow moisture out and allow air in and, and dry the grain uh, a, a little better. But it makes very uncomfortable covering. Very uncomfortable. Now, I, I want to just. Put this in here as I, I move quickly along. You find Jonah was was always to his comfort. God God was always having to needle him. Say, okay, buddy, okay, buddy, I'm gonna make you uncomfortable. So you'll do my will. All right, I'm gonna make you uncomfortable. And God was always having to prod him out of his little comfort zone. And yet, and yet the people of Nineveh, as wicked and as sinful and as I and as far from God as they were, all of them voluntarily picked up the most uncomfortable garment that you could wear and voluntarily put it on. The Bible said from the king, the highest in the land. Brother Chadwick, can I, can I borrow your jacket there? The highest in the land to the least. They took the most itchy, uncomfortable, irritating cloth. And they put, well, this is going to be anointed. This, this. The Bible said they covered themselves with sackcloth. Now, as you begin to go through the Bible, you find that sackcloth was never worn at feasts. It was never a sign of frivolity. It was never a, a, a 
at a festival. It was never used at a time of celebration. It was, it was usually in connection to mourning. When people were in mourning for the dead, they would clothe themselves with sackcloth. And it was said, this hurts. This is a grievous time. I am not comfortable at this time. It was an outward sign. It was an outward expression of, of something going on down inside that they were sorry for the loss. They were grieving over what the, the, they were feeling down on the inside. And they would clothe themselves with sackcloth during a time of grief. It was never an indicator of pleasant times or happy times whatsoever. But it was often a sign of their mourning. You find that that uh, when Jacob was told uh, that he had lost his son Joseph, uh, uh, the Bible said that he, it's first indication that I find, that he clothed himself in sackcloth. Uh, he ripped his clothes uh, and he put sackcloth upon his loins uh, and he mourned for his son many days. And you find that when Abner died, uh, that David took sackcloth uh, and he draped himself with it. Uh, amen. And he mourned for Abner. Uh, you find that Rizpah, when her sons were hung uh, between the sky and the earth uh, and their bodies uh, were laid out there left to be uh, devoured by the fowls of the air, that she took sackcloth uh, and she stayed out there under the stars at night uh, and she'd take that sackcloth uh, and wave the vultures away from her children. Uh, it's never been, it's never been uh, an indication of frivolity or celebration, uh, but it is one of mourning uh, and desperation. Uh, you find during a time of terrible famine in Samaria that the king is walking out through the city uh, and he's overlooking and he's, and he's looking at the people and, and communicating with them. Uh, and a woman comes up and says, King, uh, I need your wisdom on this matter. Uh, I've got a friend uh, and the famine has been so great uh, so so uh, grave that uh, that uh, i have a son and she has a son and and uh, we 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 got so desperate for something to eat we made an agreement that today i'll boil my son and we ate my boy and today we were supposed to eat her son they resorted to cannibalism and she's hid her child. And it's not fair. And the king is aghast at how low Israel has stooped in their famine and how desperate they are. And he ripped his clothes. And when Israel saw him, they saw that inside of his kingly robe, he was clothed with sackcloth, that there was grieving, there was discomfort. Y'all still with me? Hezekiah finds out that Sennacherib is going to uh, take over Jerusalem, sends Rabshakeh the messenger, and, and when... And, and when the messenger says, we're going to bring Jerusalem down, that Hezekiah goes to the house of God, uh, and Hezekiah puts on sackcloth, uh, and, and he goes to the Lord, says, God, uh, God, I'm not going to be comfortable. Uh, I could sit in my marble hauled palace. Uh, I could drink the finest of the fine uh, and eat the king's meat, uh, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to stay here, uh, and I'm going to wear some sackcloth. Uh, I refuse to get comfortable uh, until God does something. I refuse to settle into my leisure. God, I want you to know I'm not settled in my comfort zone. God, I want you to know I'm not settled in my leisure. I need you to do something for me. I want you to see this sackcloth that's, that is proof to you. I'm desperate for you to do something in my life. Amen. David and the elders as the plague came through Israel slew 70,000 David and the elders went up there to Mount Moriah and they were clothed 
every one of them in sackcloth. And when God saw their response in the plague, when God saw that they were afflicting themselves, uh, He stayed the hand of the destroying angel. Oh Lord, I could preach so much about this sackcloth tonight. Uh, Mordecai, uh, Mordecai, uh, you know that Haman is going to destroy all the Jews, not if I can help it. Uh, Mordecai, uh, Haman hates you. uh, And he don't care that Esther is the queen. uh, He's going to bring every Jew down uh, and there's going to be an absolute uh, annihilation uh, of the people of God. Not if I can help it. Um, tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm not going to try to use my personality. Uh, I'm not going to try to find techniques before the king. Uh, but I'm going to go sit in ashes. Uh, and I am going to clothe myself with sackcloth. Uh, and I just believe that God uh, is going to see my desperation. Uh, and I just believe God is going to see uh, that I refuse to be comfortable uh, that I refuse to sit back and take it easy Uh, I'm going to flick my flesh Uh, I'm going to live in discomfort for a while uh, until God does something for us Amen different times in scripture the prophets would call for the people come on and be clothed with sackcloth you find it in Isaiah to trade your Beautiful garments for sackcloth. You find it in Jeremiah. You find it in Ezekiel. That there would be a day that their songs and their mirth would be turned to sackcloth and ashes. It's clear to me that there was some secret, some secret in this, that that in David's situation and Hezekiah's, situation and Mordecai's situation that there's something in this that God responds to that there's something in this that gets God's attention Nineveh got in on this secret I'm not sure that they knew who David was I'm not sure they understood who Hezekiah was I'm not sure they had ever heard about Mordecai but they got in on a secret that says if people get desperate for God they'll find him if people really repent God will turn and have mercy where he was planning to have judgment and I want to tell you the church Church needs to get in on the secret that old pagan Nineveh got in on thousands of years ago. And that is there is something that will turn the heart of God. There is something that will cause God to respond to our prayer and our cry and our plea. And that is if we will learn the fine art of draping our prayer and draping our lives and draping our routine with sackcloth. (laughs) Even Ahab, as godless as he was, turned the heart of God. As many, in fact, there had never been anybody more wicked in Israel than Ahab and Jezebel. And yet, when God sent him a message... The Bible said he began to walk humbly and he clothed himself with sackcloth. Hey, I'm going to tell you, there's a time to put the king's robe off. There's a time to take off the the suit of the dignitary and the celebrity and the important person and put on the sackcloth. And here is the city of Nineveh. Everybody. The king himself got off of his throne, laid aside his robe as soft and silky as it must have been, and covered himself. Y'all with me? This is not distracting, is it? He covered himself in sackcloth. It spoke of mourning. It spoke of humility. There's no impressive royal 
garments here. It's just the dull wrapping of sackcloth. Not trying to be important. Not trying to be somebody. It speaks of paying the price. It speaks of taking the consequences voluntarily. It speaks of repenting. It speaks of the refusal. I'm not going to be comfortable until God does something. And while the king has has left his royal robes and is wearing sackcloth and while all the nobles have laid aside their apparel of dignity and they are draped in sackcloth and while the least the poorest of the poor are walking through the streets with sackcloth and they've been so careful not to grieve the heart of God they've been so careful to have reverence for the almighty who has sent them this message that they've taken their beast of burden they've taken their old donkey they've taken their milk cow and they draped them with the burlap said hey everybody we're not going to take any chances everybody's going to grieve everybody's going to get uncomfortable everybody's going to carry the burden everybody's going to be concerned from the greatest to the least it's going to be covered with sackcloth and just maybe God is going to answer just maybe oh I wonder what kind of church we could have if everybody quit trying to be important if everybody quit competing with one another if everybody would quit worrying about what so and so said about them and would get the spirit of sackcloth and say God I'm not worried about opinions I'm not worried about popularity I'm not worried about criticism I just need you to do something in my church, in my family, in my home. I need it. I need it. And I, it didn't matter how sinful and ungodly they were. God looked down at this attitude of sackcloth. And God said, I can work with somebody that can be that humble. It's time for the message of sackcloth to be preached to the church in the 21st century. We've been taught how to be important. We've been taught how to be powerful. We've been taught how to have charisma and personality. We've been taught how to praise our way and worship our way into all the blessings and prosperity of God. We've been taught how to bind the devil, how to step on top of Satan. We've been given seven keys to success and wealth. We've been given all the keys to being effective and being powerful and moving people and giving great altar calls. But I'm going to tell you there's something missing from the church today. I'm not just talking about Truth Harbor. I'm talking about the church uh, all around this world. uh, And that is a spirit uh, of sackcloth. uh, That is a spirit of repentance. uh, That is a spirit of prevailing prayer uh, that says I'm going to get into a place of prayer uh, that says I will not be comfortable. uh, I will not go back to my leisure, my ho-hum existence uh, until I see God uh, do something in my church and in my family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just like a fast is like a 24 hour prayer. So it was with the wearing of sackcloth. It communicated how seriously they wanted to get right with God. And while the king is clothed, while the nobles are clothed, and while every beast is clothed, the only one, the only one, that's worried about his comfort and worried about others and worried about his own uh, his, his, his own little kingdom. The only one that doesn't have sackcloth is Jonah. As he sits a little ways away from the city of Nineveh where everybody's praying, where everybody is calling where everybody's repentant.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save.